<laughs> that's uh that's the uh the 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 uh, uh it, the loyalty points that we award followers of our oh our podcast thank, they get current C. thank goodness um <clears throat> all right i need to oh i forgot to put this in here um uh, let's see what i want to type here i'm going to type something it's going to be good oh and I believe in crystal light Mm-mm. Okay. Because I believe in me. <laughs> <laughs> Forgotten that commercial ever existed until right now. Because you know it. All right, here we go. Uh, kicking it off in three, two. Volume, volume, one. I have current game. Current game. Current game. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Current Geek, the talk show about items of interest to the geeks of the world and you. I'm Scott Johnson. He's Tom Merritt. That is exactly right, Scott. Hi. Look at you with the gavel all set to go, man. Mm -hmm. I was quick on the gavel today, wasn't I? I don't remember anything today. Today is a bit of a blur. One of those days. Yeah, where, one of those, huh? Yeah, too much. Well, Scott, let me tell you, you and all the rest of our audience just sit back, take a deep breath, relax the spine. You know, release the tongue from the top of the mouth. Okay. Open up yeah. and get ready for a, a lovely hour of talking about geeky things. You're like my tantric supervisor. Or is that that's mm. something else, isn't it? We don't want to talk about tantric. I anymore. think that's not me. <laughs> yeah. You've got me confused with somebody else. <laughs> you may I don't want to say who. Yeah. But I and I don't want to know who. No. Yeah, I understand completely. <laughs> uh well, it's good to be back, everybody. Welcome back. It's uh, Current Geek, and uh, again, it's our little talk show episode and we love doing these because a lot of stuff has happened since we last spoke and we have a lot to say about those things so let's get started herbert hoover secretary of commerce in 1922 finds infant radio facilitates news gathering as do many others in high public office tom what happened well uh two of the greatest podcasts of all time titled their shows disney jumps the gun oh. because of this news <clears throat> Those two shows were Cord Killers and The Morning Stream. Mm. Uh, Disney has rehired James Gunn as director of Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Uh, Deadline says the decision was made months ago. They're just letting people know now. Guardians of the Galaxy 3 is in development. However, it has push been pushed back from its original 2020 release date. There's no new release date yet because Gunn is still going to direct Suicide Squad for DC. In fact, Peter Safran who is producing Suicide Squad, also produced Aquaman, Shazam, and the first Suicide Squad, uh, says Suicide Squad is still Gunn's first priority, and then he'll do Guardians 3. They're all cool with that. They're like, yep, yeah, we know he's going to do Guardians 3 right after Suicide Squad. That's all good. Uh, Saffron also took the opportunity to point out that the Suicide Squad movie that Gunn will do is going to be a total reboot, mm. not a sequel. He's like, it's not called Suicide Squad 2 for a reason. Uh, for instance, Idris Elba has taken over as Deadshot. Will Smith played him in the original movie. And this Suicide Squad, the James Gunn Suicide Squad, is scheduled for August 6, 2021. Well, uh, color me uh, pretty excited about this. It's a, it's a good day if you are a Guardians fan, I think, but also if you are specifically a James Gunn Helms the Guardians franchise fan. And also, if you're a fan of Drax the Destroyer, because he has gone on record saying that if James Gunn uh, wasn't part of the film, that he was going to bail. Also, now, I don't know how serious he was about that or what how binding his contract may have been, but I, I'm glad they don't have to recast Drax the Destroyer necessarily. So Dave Batista's in, one would presume. Uh, one would presume. Yeah. Overall, though, I like, I like the idea that in this uh, sort of trying time, of people and their behavior and it reflecting poorly upon them and being uh, decisions being made in public about whether or not they should uh you know be uh, working for whoever they work for and especially given disney's much stricter guidelines in terms of that sort of thing it's a nice sign that hey we can tell that even though you did this stuff 10 years ago you said these things on twitter you apologized for them before actually before even guardians one was out and now you've done it all over again and we kind of know you better now and everyone knows you better like there's something here that's good there's a there's a uh there's a there's a sense of yeah i screwed up thank you for believing me or giving me a second chance let's go make another you know 
bunch of money together <laughs> basically is what it'll amount to but i i don't know why that appeals to me but it does there's a redemptive quality to this it's a redemption story exactly yeah. exactly so hopefully yeah, that's hopefully why it appeals it, to you, i think i mean i hope that i hope that it's all the right thing for everybody ar- uh, around i haven't heard a lot of dissent about this because it feels like we've heard a lot worse things from people since this uh firing and those people stayed employed <laughs> so it's like it's almost like it's also lessened because it seems a little trivial in light of other things that have happened in media uh, in recent months. So I, I personally am happy about it. Um, I didn't love Guardians 2. I liked it. I thought it was pretty good, but I didn't love it the way I did the first movie. So just from a purely like, what do I hope for from Guardians 3? What I hope for is, you know, James Gunn to get back to, to what made that first one so great and maybe do some of that again. I mean, I think that's something people forget about. I, I'm I'm just going to set aside the whole issue of whether he should be forgiven or not forgiven, uh, and just go with the the movie side of of, of this for the moment. Uh, I I think we all love Rocket and Drax and Peter Quill and Gamora mm-hmm. uh, and and Groot, uh, and we can see that in Avengers of Fin Infinity War uh, yeah. and. There is a confusion between those characters and James Gunn. James Gunn brought them to life in directing the first movie uh, and, you know, helped bring them to life with the actors, obviously. Uh, Guardians Galaxy 2 is interesting because, again, definitely not as popular uh, with fans, even though it's those same characters. And one wonders, well, did James Gunn just, you know, have a first album hit? because he spent so much time thinking about what he would do with Guardians and then sophomore slump with Guardians 2. And now that he'll have a third chance, he'll be able to bring it back. Or is it uh, just a, a, a kind of a mistake that that Guardians was originally so good and he'll never be able to replicate it? Mm. We have an ability now, thankfully, in my opinion, to find out uh, by letting him do three. We also now, because of all of this, have another sort of controlled experiment, which is, how much is it Marvel and Kevin Feige and how much is it James Gunn? Uh, because mm. now we're going to get to see James Gunn do a very similar property. It's not a, it's not exact. I know, but you know, a, a collection of misfits, uh, you know, fight fighting as heroes when they really aren't uh, it describes guardians of the galaxy. And it also describes suicide squad. So we'll see what he can do when he's not in the Marvel universe too. Yeah. I'm actually more funny about all this is I'm more excited about that. Suicide Squad reboot. It's kind of a reboot too, not so much a sequel, from what I can tell. Uh, at yeah. least early talk says it's not. You know, that's almost exactly the words that I used just now. When yeah, I said you did say story. as as described by Tom Merritt. Um, I, part of me is like, well, okay, but we'll see. Anyway, the point is, yes, let's see him apply that that there and see if he can do it. That'd be great. Uh, let's see if he can make the third time the charm. But I would remind people that if they're like, oh, James Gunn really slumped on the second one. I'm not saying you're saying that, but others have mm-hmm, suggested mm-hmm. that. The I would point to uh, other Marvel uh, stuff like this where you got uh, Joss Whedon comes out with a stellar opening with, uh, with Avengers. An amazing movie. Everyone still loves Avengers. The first Avengers. Age of Ultron, not so good. It's okay. It's not great. Uh, I'd say the same thing happened to Favreau with Iron Man 2008. And then Iron Man 2010 isn't so great. Same director. Uh, so this happens. And I don't think it's surprising. I think it's a hard thing to do to well, follow it's, up it's your It's that thing. sophomore slump that right. I was talking about. It happens yeah. in, in, in other creative endeavors too. See, this is what I'm going to do this entire episode. You're going to say a thing very shortly and succinctly. <laughs> and then I'm going to drag it out to way more hot air than I need to. That's what I'm going to do. So you're going to, you're going to say sophomore slump, which perfectly describes it. And then I'm going to describe sophomore slump in about four paragraphs. No, but but see, the difference is uh, what you're talking about is when somebody does something really good the first time, and then when they try to follow it up, it's not as successful because it's harder to follow up a success. <laughs> right. I'm having my own sophomore slump in explaining the sophomore slump. <laughs> it's explained. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, I'm one way or the other, though. I, I, I don't know that it's – I mean, now there's – there, the expectation, by the way, is back on. So – Maybe yeah. more intensely yeah, yeah. than it would have been before. It it may before it may have been well two is okay. Let's see what he does with three. Now it's ooh you're coming back from this thing and it's a lot of pressure now and ooh boy don't screw this up. I hope the movie's good and, and worth having you come back. Like there's that extra level of whatever that it, we as fans and 
certainly I'm sure executives at Disney and other are going to throw on this. So uh, I wonder what this does to the roadmap, right? Like how how cut and paste are the arc elements of each Marvel movie where what was supposed to show up in a Guardians 2020 release? Will that now show up in a different Marvel movie mm -hmm. that moves the, the, you know, the overall path of all of this universe along? Yeah, that's a very good question. But mm -hmm. uh, when's the, did you, you probably said in your thing, when is, uh, or maybe you didn't, let's see, Suicide Squad 2021. All right. Yeah, it was the last thing I said. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm very much looking forward to that and hurry up because we're not getting any younger is all I wanted to say. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's tell Scott about this later. Uh, but there's a trend in robotics called soft robots. Scott, are you listening? Yes, yeah, soft robots. Got it. <laughs> Uh, soft robots, to oversimplify, means you use softer materials. So instead of a robot with, you know, metal hands, uh, you, you've got gels and, 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 and soft things. Uh, that is a new trend in robotics. A team led by a woman named Daniela Roos at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, or CSAIL, has developed a robot gripper that can lift 100 times its own weight. It's a skeleton shaped like a starfish covered in a loose rubber skin. And so that skin is what makes it soft. Mm. Uh, gas can be pumped in or out of the rubber enclosure, causing the device to open or close kind of like a flower. But even though it looks like just a limp flower, it can pick up delicate objects, uh, things like glass uh, or fragile items without harming them, but still maintaining a firm grip so it doesn't drop them. It can also handle irregularly shaped objects because it's not meant to pick up a thing in a certain way. Now, Roos thinks her gripper is better than previous soft robot models that worked like tentacles or bean bags because it can approach items from a variety of angles. It's just a little flower. You just got to push it in the right direction. And that origami-like starfish skeleton has some strength uh, along with the flexibility of the soft covering. Uh, do we feel good about, I mean, this is the old thing to do, isn't it? But do we feel okay about making a robot that can lift a hundred times its own weight and not well, worry about you gotta it? look at this thing too. Like this thing weighs very little. Yeah. <laughs> so a hundred times its own weight could be a pound. Sure. Like it's not, it's probably more than a pound, but you know, it's not, it's not that much. This is not a very, because it's so soft and delicate itself. The, the key here is the fact that it can actually lift something without breaking it uh and and be adaptive so it can provide some dexterity to robots that robots don't usually have yeah which is really really cool like i don't want to i don't want to poo-poo this thing because i think the future is probably uh even when we get to a point where they're kind of humanoid or or uh, maybe they're never humanoid but but they're larger well, this and is more a great dexterous. example of whether do they need to be humanoid if you had humanoid fingers that makes it harder to program to be able to do things that we can do yeah. But with this thing, it's just just like a bell, right? Mm -hmm. And it just drapes over whatever it needs to pick up, and then it clamps in, picks it up. I mean, I used to think the idea when Doctor Who would say, not they would say, but they would they would show those uh, exterminate robots for what are they called? Oh yeah, the the, the, uh, the Daleks. Daleks. They'd show those, and I'd go, those aren't practical. Those are dumb. I almost called them daikons. <laughs> Why not? Just dangerous radish. But if mm. you, but if you. Uh, that's a great band name, Dangerous Radish. Dangerous Radish, isn't it? Oh, I would play. Yeah. I would so play no, guitar it for really them. Is. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, like, they when I would see those when I was younger, I'd go, "Well, those aren't practical. Those aren't going to be useful. Those are dumb. They're slow. They're they don't have arms that are worth anything. Like, it's dumb." But more and more as I've gotten older, and as I've seen robot and robotics stuff uh, progress, and you start to see what various you know companies and and countries are doing in the in the field. You start to go, oh, you know what? They'll probably end up being like. I mean, science fictionally, we want, you know, I robot, guy walking around looking like me. But I'll bet you in practicality, the far flung, super smart robots of the future are going to be very specialized and their shapes will reflect that. Do you know what I mean? So, like, yeah. these things aren't going to be a dude with a face because it's not practical unless we need something like that. What instead we'll need is something that's really good at changing. Uh, a giant window out and so it needs giant suction cups and the right physics and machinery and engineering to go shunk and pull it off and not have any problem pulling it off and putting it away no matter how smart it is no matter how exacting it is it's going to be specialized for that job 
And I form think, follows function. Yeah. So if a robot is meant to work with humans, it might need to be more humanoid right. just so that we get along better with it, right? Mm -hmm. And it fits in the same spaces we do and all that sort of thing. But if the robot is, is just doing a specialized task where it needs to pick up delicate pharmaceutical bottles or something, uh, then it doesn't need to look human. It could just have this bellflower thing. It could have four of them. You know, It doesn't even have to have two. Well, for people keeping home a score at home, I did it again. Tom said form follows function, which I said in about four paragraphs, and he said it in a single idiom. So yeah, I but just... this time I did it after you. You had to prompt me. <laughs> All right, okay, no, no, fair enough. No, you yeah. you did what I was trying to do earlier terribly. Like you <laughs> summed it up. I don't know. I feel like this is a good educational episode for me and the audience on how to <laughs> sh shrink your shit down. Look, if you got to go do if you got to go do a TED talk, right, and you know mm. everything there is to know about chimpanzees and primates, let's say and you've been asked to do a TED Talk, you don't do your TED Talk and tell them everything you know about every aspect of a primates and apes. You sum it up in 20 minutes or less. Tom Merritt, boy, just teaching the lessons each and every week here on Current Geek. Turns out I'm using my degree. <laughs> oh, good. Really? That's I awesome. never thought I would. But yeah, no, I have a journalism degree. One of the things you learn in journalism school is how to sum things up in the fewest amount of words possible. Oh, just think, if you were a working reporter right now, just think of the clickbait headlines we'd have today. It'd be amazing. Ah, I know. I used to be in charge of headlines at CNET before clickbait was really, you know, had really gained all of its steam. Hmm. Uh, I missed it. Yeah. Missed the, the peak times. <laughs> uh, hey, here's some, some cool stuff. Amazon revealed a finalized map for its Lord of the Rings series on March 7th. So, you know, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the island of Numenor shows up in the lower left-hand corner of the map, which, if you know your Lord of the Rings lore, confirms that not only will the show take place in the Second Age, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings all take place in the Third Age, uh, but it will take place before the battle between Sauron and the Alliance of Elves and Men, because that's what ended the Second Age. And Numenor was already sunk before the end of the Second Age. Uh, so we're going to be somewhere in the middle of Middle Earth's history, in the middle of the Second Age. Oh, well, that's great. I mean, now we at least know, well, not so much, well, I don't know much about the setting, quote, quote unquote, setting, like the physical surroundings of this age. Mm. But at least we know time frame wise, that's cool. That's an exciting part of the of the uh, of the Tolkien universe. Less. I was guessing in my head yeah. that we were going to see the events leading up to the battle, right? The yeah. forging of the alliance of elves and dwarves and men, you know, and and that the series would end with that big battle scene, uh, you know, where you see the arrow flip past uh, Elrond's eye and he, you know, he blinks and and Isildur gets the ring and all of that. Uh, turns out, no, that's that, I mean, maybe the series ends up there eventually, but, uh, we're at least going to see the sinking of Numenor before that happens. So we've got a lot of other stuff to tell. Yeah. And listen to how long that age takes. So, I mean, an age is a long time, no matter how you describe it, but the second age spans 3,441 years. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, ends with the first downfall of Sauron. That's pretty And Numenor gets sunk because it's human, uh, lords conspire with Sauron. Yeah. So I'm, I'm we're genuinely gonna a, stoked. We're going to see like a young Sauron. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, a young, <laughs> when he was more than just a big eye in the sky. Millennial be... <laughs> Sauron. <laughs> right. Young. Long hair, Nirvana t-shirt, you know, sure. something like that. Working two jobs. He's got that, uh, he's doing the, the coffee shop on the weekends. Yeah, he drives Uber, you know, in the evening. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for this. Actually, I'm really excited for this because it's the granddaddy of them all. It's the one... It's the one uh, fantasy lord. You like to rule driving them Uber? All. Uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm studying to become a dark lord who dominates the earth, but it pays the bills. You know. Yeah. Or you, where are you planning? Where you want to end up? I'm probably Mordor. I'm thinking. I've so. got this idea for some uh, some rings yeah. that I want to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some jewelry, line of jewelry. I want to get into. <laughs> I love I love the idea that he had such humble beginnings, but maybe the show. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the show will probably fiddle around with this some. You know, some of these ideas, but. Well, you you get the rings thing, right? Yeah, you get you literally get the rings. I wonder if there's any crossover with the uh, um, the video game series called Sh the Shadow of Mordor. Games are, are interesting. Are they set in the Second Age? Uh, ah. Well, they're uh, I don't count don't don't totally count me on this or quote me on the this, but no. they, <laughs> they they you want, the guy you roll with during the whole game as kind of your little spirit helper ghost guy 
is the elf who forged the ring, the one ring. Ah, okay. And I don't know where the timeline goes. I think we are going to see pre-ring Sauron. Oh, yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Do you think it'll be just like pre-ring is in like just a dude hanging out? thinking about what he wants to be well he's always he always wanted to dominate everyone he just hadn't hit on the ring idea oh. right now he's just taking his rings to the to the uh the farmer's market on the weekend <laughs> he hasn't figured out how to imbue them with the ability to you know control all of the world yeah free range rings he's in he hasn't those. hit on the one ring to rule them all no he's that's like, hard how to do these rings work no. you know i give them away and then they just get out of my control rings how do they work i gotta keep trying yeah well it's uh i'm stoked so hurry up uh, uh, Shadow Shadow of Mordor takes place in the Third Age, according to Kurt the Cast. Oh, it is Third Age. Well, it takes place in the Third Age, but it has all kinds of references, I think, to the Second Age, which is what I'm thinking of. Because there's flashbacks to when, I forgot his name, the elf <clears throat> uh, forges the ring and all that. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there's some crossover there. But but also, I don't think they'll ca they count those games as, as, uh, as canon. Uh, maybe they do, or maybe they don't. They're very good, but I don't. I don't think they're canon. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. What else do we have today? Uh, Don Reese Davies. You might know him as uh, uh, Gimli, Glowen's son from Lord of the Rings. But he was also in a show called Sliders. And he told FlickeringMyth.com at Toronto that he and Jerry O'Connell, also from the show Sliders, are in talks with NBC about Sliders. NBC is trying to figure out who owns the rights to the new productions of the IP. Mm -hmm. uh, the first three seasons were on Fox. They were then moved to Universal-owned Sci-Fi, and NBC Universal is the distributor of the reruns now. Uh, but apparently, they're they're not quite sure if that covers everybody they need to ask before they make new ones and start distributing new ones. I loved Sliders. I did too. It was great. Big fan. Yeah. Especially it, those first few seasons. Yeah. I didn't, it, it was really fun. I, did, I don't remember the later seasons as much, yeah. but because uh, you do lose John Reese Davies later in the year. It mm -hmm. was like a lighter hearted, I don't know, it had a kind of Stargate quality to it. A little bit of that and like Quantum Leap thrown in. Like it's just kind of a, a, a more fun take on the on the genre of time travel and, and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And I thought it was a good time. I would totally welcome this back. Um, the idea that these guys would be involved is super interesting to me. Um, I don't know what I would expect from it in 2019 or, or you know, a modern take is a little bit out of where, where my imagination goes. For me, it's very stuck in the 90s, kind of the thing you'd watch between TNG and a, a new episode of, uh, I don't know, Hercules. <laughs> like the, that was the era for this sort of thing. And it, and it, it was great for what it was. I don't know how it, I just don't know how it lands now. So I, I would have to see how this works out, but sure. I mean, John, John Reese Davies, I don't think is saying I'll play the same guy, right, you know, right. and run around maybe, you know, maybe he'll have a cameo or something. Uh, same with Jerry O'Connell. Maybe they'll play like the people who help the next generation to start sliding or figure out how to get stop sliding or, or, or whatever. But uh, that idea of, visiting alternate universes i think would be fantastic i i i like i said really love that concept didn't they didn't they well correct me if i'm wrong but what when they would do that they would slide into these different dimensions sometimes slightly different sometimes vastly different but there was always like a almost like a timer and they had to get the hell out of there at a certain point right yeah I, if i remember right and uh sliders fans forgive me if i'm if i'm getting this wrong they they had used john reese davies character's device to slide to an alternate reality yeah but it got broken uh and so whenever they slid they there was a a certain amount of time they had until they could the window would open for them to slide to the next one but they never knew if they were actually going back to their original point. It may not be that it was totally broken. It was just, it, it, there was just a quirk to it. And the, so A, they couldn't be sure they were sliding back to their earth and B, they couldn't control when the sliding happened. Uh, they had to slide at a certain time or they'd be stuck. Yeah, it always made me wonder if they ever, did, I don't know if they did by the end of the series, but if they ever slid back to the original one, let's say it was exactly like the original dimension given that they're probably, you know, infinite dimensions. They get as close as possible. The only difference is everyone has a mustache. <laughs> that you'd, you'd think that if you got there, you just go, okay, this is good. I'll, we can do this. This will be good enough. No, you know what I want to do. What? 
uh, they 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 keep coming back to the same earth but it's at different points in time so uh they they started sliding in the year 2000 yeah. and they slide back to 2010 united states of what there's a black president mm -hmm. oh, this can't be our year so they slide again and they come back in 2017 wait donald trump's president Nah, this can't be our earth. they slide again <laughs> have them go to all the inexplicable moments in history yeah Whatever they may be, those are two great modern ones. But the, you can find all kinds of stuff. Like, I, I don't, I can't think of any right now. But because these, because those two are the probably the most like, would be the most interesting to play with. But, but yeah, like that would be. There's your, there's your idea. Get in there, John Rees Davis, and don't let Go anyone eat those dates. They're figure poisoned. out those rights, NBC. That's right. You, th there is a part of me thinking like NBC is like, sure, John, no, I'd love to take me. Ah, the rights though. Mm. Oh, the right. We got to figure out the rights. Yeah, but it does seem if Sci-Fi Channel is involved, it doesn't say they are. They're just talking about where they were moved. But if Sci-Fi Channel is in and in, in, all involved at all, that's part of NBC Universal. It might just be easy. You know, this might well, not be hard at all. I, no, I mean, the, yes, that's that's that is it is true that. Sci-Fi Channel is where the later years were, uh, and MB and I, <laughs> I said that NBC owns them. Yeah, yeah, no, I knew that, but I'm, I, I guess what I'm saying is, but it's is not it, easy, right? Because Fox was involved and other production companies were involved, so that's I guess what's causing it. Well, they should just st call it Slippers and just make a new one. <laughs> we're slipping again. Oh no, ah, I'm slipping, slipping to an alternate galaxy. Oh no. Donald Trump's hey, uh, back in our universe, scientists in Japan have published findings in scientific report reports on recovering cell nuclei from the remains of a Siberian woolly mammoth that was found in permafrost nine years ago. The muscle cell nuclei from the mammoth, who they call yuca, were transplanted into mice eggs, mice oocytes to be exact, and showed biological activity. So this is a big deal. They took nuclei from dead mammoths uh put them into mice eggs and the nuclei started doing stuff now they showed the spindle assembly histone incorporation some partial nuclear formation they did not divide mm. full activation was not confirmed that means you couldn't have the cell divide and start making a new mammoth yet but it's a it's a pretty big step to be able to see any of that biological activity happen at all because it means those nuclei were not dead so, uh, we're not we're not destroyed. They weren't useless. They they could actually part way get there. Like if you just find the right ones, maybe you get them all the way there, and we start making ourselves a mammoth. So not some the, the race of uh, mammoths didn't happen here because they were they didn't uh, nothing happened if they. I mean here okay. So let's say let's say you took an active um, nuclei from me. Okay, a working cell from my body. Sure. Right now, living and everything, you take it out mm -hmm. and you put it in that same mouse egg. Would yeah. those divide? That's called uh, stem cell uh, manipulation. Oh, that, is that, it? That's called in vitro fertilization. Like, <laughs> yeah, we absolutely can do that right now. All right. So that's the thing that works and the cells divide and yeah, they do what they have to do. That's worked for decades. Okay. But when you're talking about ancient stuff that's been sitting around This forever. is a, a, a muscle cell nuclei that's been frozen in the permafrost for centuries. Okay. Uh, of a of a of an animal that no longer exists, like is absolutely been extinct for also centuries. All right, chat room says the big question. Dan Wally says, one mammoth-sized mouse or one hundred mice-sized mammoths. What would you rather have? Uh, you're just using the oocyte. You'd have to fuse <laughs> the mice and and mammoth DNA in order to get uh, a, a mouse-sized mammoth. But if you want to do that, this is the first step. Okay. Well, good. This is the first step to being able to answer that question. Good. Finally. Finally, we can say we've got that first brave new step into the mammoth mice of the future. Very exciting. Um, I love that kind of stuff. And by the way, anything that comes out of permafrost, like anytime there's news that, oh, well, they found a new uh, donkey face in, in, in the permafrost, or we're trying to figure out where he came from or whatever. I don't know why that fascinates me so much, but there's something about that. That just completely takes my imagination. Well, there's, there's, I know Jurassic Park was amber, not mm -hmm. permafrost, but there's right. that idea of like, ooh, something ancient mm -hmm. has been, you know, can be revived. Yeah, and it's now, nature's. There, there's a, yeah. there's an ethical question of whether we should, even if we were able to get these nuclei to work, whether we should, in fact, create mammoths or not. Well, like uh, Jeff Goldblum once said, you spent so much time work uh, thinking about how you could do it, 
You never stop to think about whether you should. But what he also said was life finds a way. Yeah, he did say that. Kind of contradictory, really. A little gold bloom debate going on there. Yeah, he gold bloomed my mind. <laughs> Uh, this will go bloom your mind too. Hans Zimmer, the man behind the scores of the Lion King, Thelma and Louise, Gladiator, Inception. The list is interminable. Uh, will be scoring Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Boom! One would assume that Hans Zimmer will take a different approach than Toto and Brian Eno took in the <laughs> 1984 version of the Dune movie. I forgot. Um, that. Also, uh, in the Denis Villeneuve Dune news, uh, Chang Chen, who starred in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, is apparently in talks to join the cast. Uh, we already know that the following people are going to be in Dune, which I would like to uh, all join many other people in saying will, in fact, be the sexiest movie of the year it comes out in. Mm. Rebecca Ferguson. Oscar Isaac, Josh Brolin, Stellan Skarsgård, Dave Bautista, Zendaya, Charlotte Rampling, Jason Momoa, and Javier, he, Javier Bardem. Oh, sweet. He'll have that cow gun at the end where I put it up to your head and say, hold still. <laughs> um, I am. There is no news <clears throat> of casting of Sting. No news. Ah, oh, shoot, because he still looks or good. Or Kyle McLaughlin. Yeah, both those guys hold up. They'd be all right. Uh, yeah, all good on the front here. Uh, continue to enjoy the casting news. I like everybody they're talking about. Um, I still am a little bit floored at how how compelling Dave Batista was. Uh, this you know this wrestler who had proved himself in Guardians, but you know we yeah, didn't yeah. know if it was a one note proving. Well, with Drax, it's sort of yeah, it's not it's it's like well maybe he just plays super literal guy sure, really well. Sure, right? that's what we all thought, or you know we just yeah. didn't know. He comes into that uh, Blade Runner 2049 in a small mm -hmm. role, but it was a memorable, powerful. He did a great job. Oh, so good. Job. So yeah. I am beyond excited that he's in this as a follow-up uh, to that same director's uh, attempt to make Dune. I'm more excited uh, about Dune than ever, and I love Hans Zimmer. So it's all coming up roses here. I don't have anything bad to say about any of this. Black Mirth, uh, yes. Other people were announced whose names I did not decide to try to pronounce. Today. Yes, there are some hard names in there. But the important one... <laughs> we did not name all the people who have been cast. Yeah. But if you were in a little gas station in the middle of the Southwest Desert, do not give Javier Bardem any gas. Just hide and pretend you're closed. Okay? That's all Wait, I'm saying. Wait, that also works as a Blade Runner reference, doesn't it? I think it might. <laughs> Just, that, let's mash up those movies. And don't flip any coins or something. Yeah, anyway, something. Uh, that's awesome news, and uh, bring it on. Uh, big thanks to everybody who supported us today with your fine story submissions. And you guys did that via the uh, subreddit that we have for Current Geek. And, Tom, we probably should give some of them some credit now. Who who sent these? Oh, in? yeah. No, uh, we used stories submitted by Captain Kipper, Jeff Rose, Strike It Rich One, and you could join them, uh, even if it's just by voting. If you you don't want to actually submit stories, do either one. We need more people submitting stories. You, you hear these guys' names a lot. You can, you can be submitting some crazy cool stories in there and get in there and vote as well. Currentgeek.reddit.com. I agree. Also, don't forget, you can support this show by throwing your love and support and money behind us at patreon.com slash currentgeek. That's right. Patreon.com slash currentgeek. There are cool levels in there. If you want to get a monthly membership card that is created with artwork from me and exclusive to this show and will never be anywhere else, that's a great way to get that among other things. But if you're just someone who's like, I just want to do a dollar, you can totally do that too. That's over at patreon.com slash current geek. Do it today. The future promises even more startling things to come. All right. What is startling is that we still continue. Probably some of the biggest feedback we get on the show is about the forecast segment, a thing that used to be a show. Now it's a segment where we talk about the future. We make predictions Sometimes a little outlandish, sometimes a little closer to reality. And today, Tom has it. Tom, what's your forecast? So this may be born of wishful thinking, but <laughs> I predict that someday landscaping for your home will be available as a hologram. Oh. And not only as a hologram so that you don't have to maintain that lush green uh, land or or the, the intricate succulents, uh, it will also be changeable, like a desktop pattern. So you could be that guy who has palm trees in the dead of winter or snow when you live in New Mexico and it's 90 in January. Mm. Uh, that, that 
will be, you you can change your landscaping for every holiday like cover your your lawn and and clover leaves when it's St. Patrick's Day or or trees that have easter eggs on them uh, at easter whatever you want I love this except I just thought of a big conflict and mm. let's see what you think about this so it's let, against my homeowners association rules. Well, see, uh, you're kind of inching close to what I was thinking. So, all right. As it stands right now, if you do the physical, non-easy thing that isn't a hologram change, uh, you can go out and do all crazy, all kinds of crazy stuff to your yard. And if you've got an HOA uh, or any other kind of you know neighborhood standards sort of thing that you've agreed to, uh, if I go out right now and put a giant, um, I don't know. Christmas set up in the middle of the spring, I would probably get told to take it down or else they'd say, you know, this isn't season appropriate. You know, this isn't, this kind of goes against the spirit of the, of the rules or whatever. If somebody else went out and put a bunch of strange rocks out in front or whatever, they might have the same thing. Somebody would come up and say, no, I'm sorry. Those don't, you know, comply. Even though the hologram thing would be easier, wouldn't it also be just more trolly? Like somebody could put his on rotate all night and it just is constantly popping a new look every 10 seconds like you could do with a desktop wallpaper. And sure. would you? Sure. do you think we would create a whole new level of neighborhood fightery and the, and the next door app of the future would just be full of, oh my gosh, I can't believe Bill keeps changing to his holographic, you know, penis he puts on the front yard or whatever when no one's looking like, you know, that sort of thing. Like, I, <laughs> you think we would create more of a problem because we'd have more control, more power and more responsibility, that sort of thing. Uh, to paraphrase Jeff Goldblum, just because it could be a problem doesn't mean it will be. Uh, I mean, you could say the exact same thing about amplified music. Yeah. Why, why do we allow, it's a bad idea to let people have amplified music because they can disturb their neighbors. They could put speakers in their front yard and blast heavy metal music at all their neighbors. What's to stop them, Scott? Mm. Well, what, what is to stop them is just the fact that, you know, most people don't want to annoy their neighbors. Uh, and often when people do annoy their neighbors, their neighbors tell them to stop. Uh, and more often than not, they do. And the people who don't stop uh, end up getting, you know, uh, into a conflict and, and those conflicts, you know, may not be pleasant, but are eventually resolved. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is most people won't turn all of their trees into penises. So <laughs> that would not be my major concern here. Okay. Though some people will don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. Sure. Some people will. Uh, I think that will be the, the large exception. Yeah. Probably. Someone always will. And it doesn't mm. matter where we are with the tech or where we are with anything. Somebody will always screw that stuff around and do stuff. I totally agree with you. And personally, I wouldn't be bothered. If the guy next to me went spring, summer, winter, fall in rapid rotation all night long, oh, so? Like, what's the problem? It's not really I mean, actually if, if a problem. The, if, the, if it was causing flickering and keeping you awake, and then you just call the police and say, hey, this, this guy's annoying me, right? Yeah. Uh, if, they, if they turn their lawn into something offensive, again, you call the police and say, hey, that's a public nuisance, right? Mm -hmm. There are already laws on the books for most of this stuff. Uh, and, and honestly, calling the police doesn't usually fix this stuff anyway. Cause what the police say when they come out is like, can you guys just work this out? You know, can you yeah. agree not yeah. to change your trees into penises? And can you agree <laughs> that his rocks are not offensive? They're just rocks. Right. And can everybody just, you know, get along? You're totally right. That's exactly what would happen. That's the ride along on the cops episode that we would all see. And you're right. But here's the thing. I, we, in our heads, I think it's too easy for us to go, Oh, holographic. Therefore there are lights and things. Like, no, the idea is this would create realistic landscape. Yeah, right. right. No, that's good. Really good. I'm glad you brought it back to that because that, that is the point. It's not that this is supposed to be annoying, but this is supposed to make your your uh, appearance on your front lawn look pleasant. Yeah. Right. And save energy, uh, maybe because maybe it's solar powered, uh, certainly save water mm -hmm. uh, because you don't have to keep it alive uh, and make it look realistic so that it's it's pleasant to look at. Yeah, that's my that's I, I actually think I'm all for this. And I also like the idea of a, like an, a companion app of some sort on your desktop or, or, or otherwise uh, that you could at the end of the day go, you know, what would look really cool is a bunch of ivy on the side of the house. I'm going to just draw that with the ivy tool. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then bloop, outside everybody sees what looks like 100% realistic natural ivy growing on your house. Like, that sounds like fun. Yeah. And then you when the holidays do come, the holidays would be a riot. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, man. It would be the same thing as now, except while for me it'd be easy to be like, oh, turn on holiday lights. Yep. Boom. Don't have to hang anything. 
the guy across the street now spends all afternoon programming his hologram with these new cool things and patterns that he downloaded from this cool website in Japan yep. and like knocks everybody out, right? You still have that differentiation. Yeah, totally for this. I think this is great. A fine forecast it was, Tom. Well done. Why, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I really hope this happens before I have to spend money. <laughs> that is the other thing is both of us are facing a spring of decisions and uh yeah yeah neither of us want to do it so <laughs> exactly i'm all for that hey welcome to the best thing of all time this week that's right another segment on the show where we talk about our favorite things of the week uh that we're dealing with or doing or having or consuming and we think they're really the best thing of all time this week anyway and tom's gonna start with a very british sounding thing Yes, it is. Uh, in fact, I got it at a local uh, British foods store. Uh, digestive biscuits. These are things that I have eaten regularly throughout my life at various times, but they're not always easy to find. You can't get them at Ralph's or Kroger or whatever. Um, and, and so when I get a chance to buy them, I get really excited. And I got so excited. I bought these on Saturday and I've almost finished the packet of yeah, I don't know, 25, 50 biscuits. Oh, uh, but they're just they're just great. And in an, in the US, a lot of times people want to get the dark chocolate biscuits, uh, because they're cookies. You know, British for biscuits is for cookies. Yeah. But uh I just like the plain ones. They're they're lightly sugared. They're not they don't have as many calories in it. Uh they're whole wheat already. So, you know, they've got some grains and they just taste really good. Mm, I do like these. I haven't had one Perfect in a while. Perfect with coffee and tea. So I'm looking here. Oh, yeah, there's chocolate ones. So the digestive thing is a brand or is that a kind yeah. of? OK, it's a brand. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the it's the brand name of this this line of biscuits. It's always annoyed me because it sounds like you're buying special biscuits for your digestive dis disorders. Well, and the very first time I visited uh, London in, I don't know, 96, 97, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Uh, I saw it's McVitie's is the company that makes digestives. I saw these and thought it was hilarious. Like, oh my gosh, they call their cookies digestives. I have to buy these. And then I, I bought them and loved them. Mm. Yeah, I now you're making me hungry. But I can't believe But I think the name probably goes back to that Victorian era feeling of like, oh, you you know, like like all of our sodas, mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, they were all sold as as sort of quasi medicinal, right? Sure. Uh, good, good for what ails you sort of thing. And I think these biscuits are the same thing like, oh, this aids your digestion because it's got the whole wheat and everything. Well, I see that Zoe's in our chat. She can probably confirm or deny this. But is it annoying that we call them cookies because we really did take them and made them silly sounding? You know, like when you when you get a big biscuit array, array of biscuits from a British uh, place or person, it's these amazing cookies that go well with just everything and they're mm -hmm. butter cookies and, you know, specialized cookies and all this. And they're just like fancier. And we went ahead and just said cookies. It just well, sounds stupid. Usually it's the British doing that, right? Usually the British are the are the people adding an E to something to make it like footy instead of football. Ah, do you like the footy? Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 that's also an Australian thing, so maybe it's just an Australian thing. But like, that's usually what I think of when I think of of Englishes, Anglicisms. A lot of times, it's mm. just adding the y. So I think it's fair for us to do it with, you know, cooking a biscuit becoming a cookie. Yeah, because over here it's like gravy and biscuits, which makes no sense to them. They're like, "What biscuits and gravy? What are you doing?" Why would you put gravy on a cookie? Yeah, a biscuit is a very different thing here. But and um, then we say like, "Why would I eat?" biscuits and gravy with my tea right <laughs> yeah and you guys are like why are they eating cookies with gravy and now then we all <laughs> hit each other with spanners and throw ourselves down the lift right and then the lorry takes us off to the loo. yeah we end up in the boot of the lorry yeah the boot of the lorry <laughs> that's uh peter lorry's uh autobiography it's fantastic uh and then we we pull off our jumpers <laughs> until we're left only in our pants trouser not zzz. Which is the no, no, I, I meant left only in your pants. Oh, all right. Yeah. There you, oh, all right, because I get it. Right. No, I'm with you. Uh, well done. <laughs> this is perfect. Uh, here's mine for the week. My favorite thing of all time this week, and maybe one of my favorite things of all time for a long time, <laughs> is the new anthology animated series on Netflix called Love, Death, and Rockets. Robots, sorry. I don't know why I said rockets. Uh, Love, Death, and Robots. It's, uh, gosh, about four hours worth 
17 something segments. I, I didn't get the total count. I think it's 18. Yeah. Is it 18? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not actually through them all yet. Um, did you know that they have four different episode orders and it's random which one you get? I did not know that, but that explains a lot because when I was mm -hmm. reading reviews or some, some uh, critical stuff about it, it was talking about an order that I didn't see. And I kept thinking, wait, that's the first one was this, wasn't it? And they're like, no, 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 the first one was this. So I didn't realize that, that it was not random, but that it was one of these four sets. There was a, a conspiracy theory that it had to do with the fact with whether you were, uh, whether Netflix thought you were gay or not, because the first person <laughs> who discovered it was gay and his straight friend had a different order. And they're like, aha, the, the first episode has a lesbian character in mine. And I'm, you know, it turns out that was Netflix is like, no, 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 it, it, we don't know that about you. It's totally random, which, and there are four orders, not just two. Yeah. Siri, what is uh, confirmation bias? This feels like you yeah. just answered that for me. <laughs> But anyway, it's um, really something. And I, and I just to give a little background of why this stuff is so impactful for me. When I was a kid, uh, my favorite thing to do every year was go to this animated film festival. And it, was, it would go around to the smaller kind of nerd theaters is the only way I know how to put them. But the, these small theaters in town, there were, we had like two, the Tower Theater and the Blue Mouse. And they were both these theaters that specialized in the Woody Allen revival or a freaking re-showing of some ancient movie and it was very small and very hipster and all that and every year they had an animation festival and what would happen is they would just you'd go in there and you get two or three hours straight of just animated shorts and these would often go was on to be the spike and mike yeah that sort of stuff um yeah okay. but, and they would often you'd see shorts that would end up in the academy awards for best short animated subject or whatever yeah beavis and butthead started in that yes yes it did frog I say, baseball i want to say mike judge first got his stuff out there that's where i first saw beavis and butthead mm -hmm. was in a little that's movie where i theater. first saw it too yeah and i remember thinking what the frick is this thing and soon enough you know things got crazy but it was you'd see all kinds of i still have just incredible memories like that's where um lassiter and the and the first pixar stuff got shown and mm -hmm. wasn't anywhere else but there so it was on those circuits those animation circuits and i loved it and it ranged from everything from you know, every genre you can think of, style, approach of animation. Um, you know, you started to see some computer stuff, like I said, with Pixar and that then. But it was everything across the board. And it would also range from, you know, pretty PG fair to kind of, you know, violent, sometimes oversexed, whatever. But this mix of just really eclectic stuff. And it made my imagination just pop. It was one of my favorite things in the world. And then along comes something like uh, Liquid Television on MTV. That was amazing to me because it was the same idea. You'd have just weird thing after weird thing. Some turned into series. Beavis and Butthead graduated to that and then became Beavis and Butthead after that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you had uh, Aeon Flux started there. Like all these really rad, trippy things. And I loved that. Oh, my gosh. I could watch liquid television all day and night. Jump till now. Oh, and, and I throw in there the heavy metal movie back in the day. Yeah, sure. Again, an anthology, weird, animated, a, a kind of adultish thing. And this thing is all of that, with, but with tons of modern sensibilities thrown in. It's like they dug into my brain and says, what does Scott want exactly? What, is, what would be the thing that would give him the most biggest thrill and excitement about a medium that he admires so much? What would that be? And they made it. They literally made the thing I wanted. And I love it so much, I can't stop thinking about it. I can't stop talking <laughs> about it. I can't stop recommending it. Um, there's stuff in here that is not for your kids. In fact, just don't plan any family viewing around this thing. It, it's kind of no holds barred in lots of ways. Uh, but it is also extremely creative. They go for genre stuff that I'm already a giant fan of. Tons of science fiction um really great sort of what if kind of scenarios but then beautifully rendered in different styles mind-blowing stuff uh chat Kim chicago said or sorry city and says hyper violent hypersexual it, it at times yes not always but at times um and i love it tom it's going to be my favorite thing of all time this week for many weeks i'm afraid and i'm i'm actually i'm actually dreading getting through all of them because i'm I'm, How many have you gotten through now? I kind of lost count, but I'm probably in the 10 range. 
and I've loved them so much that, and none of them have landed on me like, yeah, that one's okay, I guess. Like I have enjoyed them did, all did for their own thing. Did you start with one that was a woman seeing a murder in another apartment? No, that was number three for me. Okay, so you have a different order than me. Yeah. That was number one for me. Yeah, you must be the uh, the gay guy they're all talking about. I'm, I've, I'm, I must be, yeah. <laughs> that is an amazing visual thing. I still can't believe what that thing looked like. That was just like... I, I, I mean, obviously, there's some rotoscoping, and I, I want to learn... I want That's the other thing this makes me want to do. It makes me want to go learn about every single one of these and all their techniques. I want to know about the ones that look like video games, and did they just use some game engine to make it? I want to learn about the ones that look stylized and crazy, like the one about the murder in the apartment. Uh, the Witness, it's called. I want to learn about the hand-drawn, more anime approach to the one that's like uh, steampunk Hong Kong. Uh, if you haven't gotten to that, that is a trip. Like, there's just so much... Uh, it's so cool. Like, I just... Brr, it's made for me in every possible way. And uh, I do... If I had any hope or wish, it was that... I do wish it was a little less edgy so that I could share it with more people that I would feel okay recommending this level of edge to, if that makes any sense. Like, Yeah. No, it does. In fact, Brian Brushwood had a similar reaction where he's like, it's not that it has violence or sex or, or cursing... It just to him felt like it could have been told without it. A lot of that cases, it wasn't, yes. It wasn't yes. like it wasn't naturally coming out of the story. And Brian's not somebody who's, you know, uh, squeamish about that stuff, but he, he had the same reaction. He's like, I'd like to watch this with my kids, but you know what? Uh, some of my kids are ready for it and some of them aren't. Yeah. So. My, well, my daughter, Carter, who's 21 now, she probably would be fine, especially for most of this. It's not so much that she wouldn't be fine. She's old enough to d decide by herself. It's just that there's some of it I just would feel less comfortable sitting next to her and watching. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so I do wish that because I, I, it's kind of the kind of thing you want to share with creative people around you. You want to like geek off on it. Like it's just so good. It's so good. And I recommend it highly for anyone looking for high concept, strange stuff. Cause it's rad. The animation on these is is incredible mm -hmm. and each one is a different style yeah. i think that's that's one of the fun things is is just seeing how they pull off a venture brothers looking thing and then a, a total rotoscoped cg looking thing mm -hmm. and then uh and then a a more like uh unreal engine cutscene kind, kind of thing like yeah uh it, i've only watched six of them myself uh, but I have been impressed by the animation on, on every single one of them. They all feel like less all... impressed than you on the stories. Uh, it depends myself. on the stories. Like some of them, I've found two that I did not like. Yeah. <laughs> well, give me just name do you, the give me farming hints? one. I really liked the the one. Have you gotten that one where where they're uh, they the have mechs. mech suits? Yes. Uh, and they're defending their farm. That feels I, like that a one was good. that feels like a love letter to Starcraft in lots of yeah, ways. Yeah. But the main way is that Tychus, the voice from Starcraft, the guy who plays Tychus, plays Hank in that thing. Yeah. And there are a couple other Starcraft voice actors in that thing. So to me, it feels like oh my gosh, they made a Starcraft tribute. So it's totally. awesome. That way. that's a beautiful story. I think that one's awesome. So you like that one? Which one didn't you like? The one with the robots and the cats was Oh, was okay. it was all right. It was just sort of... Yeah, yeah hey. had a couple moments. Look what was us. the one? I watched the one that's like the Venture Brothers and uh, the vampire one. I love that one. Oh. And the um, last one I watched was the one that was like, oh, that was okay. But now I can't remember what it was. So that tells you There are a couple of them that are almost like just... They want to portray a almost a single visceral moment and then draw it out to 15, 16 minutes. And yeah, I think that's, that's the thing is... This is about animation. Yeah. And I think what Scott, what Scott is showing here is like, if you're into animation, uh, you're going to love this. Yeah. If you're like, if you're not so into animation and want story, then uh, you're not going to, you're going to be disappointed because yeah. this, these aren't, some of these stories are here to show the animation. It's a, it's a way uh, of just tweaking your imagination and, yeah, and yeah. letting you world build a little bit. Like that's why I enjoy it. Oh yeah. Them, there's I some think. good world building. Yeah. It's just some of the stories I'm like, I know exactly what's going to happen and there it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are, there are some like that. And there are some that don't seem to know quite how they want to end themselves. Like they don't know how to end it, end the thing. Like the, the vampire one, the venture brothers looking one, like you mentioned, they don't quite know how to end yeah. that. And I still really liked it though, but I think it's not, it's not cause I went, ah, oh, the story writing on display here was really something else. It was, uh, yeah. they really captured that chase and that feeling and all of that with some really basic strokes. Like it's an impressive piece visually, certainly. 
and gets the job done, even if it doesn't do it with fantastic story writing. So yeah, I, I, I oh, think that's a fair Oh, when the yogurt thing. took over, I thought was kind of cute. Oh yeah, I enjoyed yeah. that one a lot. Yeah, that had a that, short. the Futurama voice guy narrated that. I forgot his name, but he's the one that does. Um... Well, he also does Pinky, I think, right? Oh, does he do Pinky for the Pinky brain? And the brain? Does he do the brain or the brain? I mean, yeah. I didn't know that all these years. I think I can. I don't want to swear to that because on Futurama, he's the one that, um, you know, Farnsworth's like uh, uh, our arch rival in the science yeah. community, whatever that guy's name is. It's that guy who does the voice. But now that you say that, it's very reminiscent of the brain. Maybe Maurice it is. LaMarche. Is that him? You do the brain? That's what Sidian and TVZ Gun are saying. He must have been the brain. Oh, that's exciting. He is the brain. Ah, uh, that's great. I, I mean, I mostly associate with him with uh, Futurama because I watched a lot more of that than that than I did uh, Animaniacs, which we've talked about before. Yes, but, and we uh, all know. As you can tell, I am a little uh, upside down on this excited. Like, I just am real. It's almost Fury Road. No, level. and you're not alone. Don't get me wrong. Like, no. uh, but I, I, I'm trying not to pour cold water on your enthusiasm because <laughs> I, I'm not as enthusiastic. But uh, there, there are you, plenty of people who are really excited about this as well. Yeah. David Fincher producing, guy that directed. Uh, uh, yeah, John Scalzi wrote a couple of these. Oh, right. Yep, that's true. Um, some Some folks who I know from the gaming world. Um, who normally just spend all their time making trailers for other game companies? Yeah, made the. Have you seen the one where the two the two creatures face off, kind of gladiatorial, remote mind thing? Have you seen no, that? I oh, seen that one that's yet. the. For me, that was the first one. Oh wait, wait, wait. Uh, you mean where there, there's like um, kaiju kind of creatures that they control? Sort of, and they sit in chairs and have like a chip on their head that lets them control it, and the. Um, and one of them is they try to get paid to throw the match. And yes, she's like, that's no the way. one. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. No, I have seen that. That's a studio who normally just pumps out like Elder Scrolls trailers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, it's like they said, hey, y'all want to do a rad thing on your own? Like, and, and so there's a lot of that happening. It's just, man, it's just, I'm, I haven't felt this way since, since Fury Road, for real. For, for a thing that just touchstones on the stuff I'm that I react to. It's just really, really cool. So check it out. And if you want to really be blown away visually, the most stunning thing in there might be Blue Zima. That is the weirdest segment. That but I have not seen yet. It's really cool. And it's not All a right. drink that's colored blue, just so you know. All right. Well, I went off on that long enough. Uh, if you have your own best thing of all time this week, you can send yours in and we might read them on the show at currentgeek at gmail.com. Don't forget, uh, next week is an autopilot edition of the show where we talk about Ashes of Love. <laughs> this is not as lovey-dovey as it sounds uh, from the name. And the first episode, I actually went back and double-checked just to make sure I wasn't misremembering, is very fantasy. Mm. Seriously fantasy. Like gods and monsters fantasy. And okay. I'm so curious what Scott thinks of this. It's a it's a Chinese network fantasy series. Uh, and, and there's so many elements of it remind me of Warcraft that I, I can't believe they aren't consciously like saying let's make this look like uh you know the elf realm and let's make this look like uh some something in uh in the you know the demon realm it would so, not surprise yeah. me uh, they, they, the chinese are famous for not only loving the the warcraft vibe but mm -hmm. also grifting it left and right for various projects and things and sure video games. sure so why not the look here i mean i think that's great there's a nice iteration there so i'm actually excited because i have no i have zero expectations i don't know what this thing is so for me, and I, I'm you know. excited because I got sucked into it by my wife, who's way into these these Korean and Chinese and Japanese dramas, uh, and I was like, you know what, this is actually a pretty interesting story, uh, and so I, I have no idea what you're going to make of it just just off this first episode. Yeah, I'm excited. So there's that, and we'll do that next week. That's Ashes of Love, available on Netflix for those hoping to get it easily. That's just about as easy as you get these days. So do check that out. Uh, and also, uh, Legal Geek's whole family, including the geek himself, are down with the flu. Oh, no. So no show this week from him or no segment from him. He'll be back next week stronger than ever, though, talking about some rad aspect of the law and the nerdy stuff we're into. So do check Get out. well, Legal Geek. Yeah, we hope you feel better. Tom, in the meantime, uh, I'm sure there's other content and things that people can find with your name on it. Anything you want to recommend? Yeah. Um, you know what? Particularly today, I want to uh, point out that I did an interview with Jack Conti, CEO and founder of Patreon. 
Uh, and since we do so many things on Patreon, I, I feel like more people might be interested in this than usual. They, they announced new plans for creators. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I sat down with him in this very room and said, so this is a price rise, right? Uh, so you're doing this because investors want to rake more cash in for Patreon, right? And he answered those questions. Uh, you can find that at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Wow. Getting right to the heart of the issues over there at uh, DailyTechNewsShow.com. Uh, for me, I would recommend... Uh, Honestly, check out my Twitter account because lately I've been trying to draw something new every day. And um, oh, cool. I've got a bunch of art projects in the mix, but what's uh, part of that is me just doing regular studies and exercises every day and certain things I want to draw and cover and, you know, sketch and sometimes finish. And so if you haven't been catching all of that, there are a few ways you can do it. A lot of it I put up on the website at frogpants.com. But if it's easier for you to want to just kind of check it social media style, you can follow me on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Or you can find my Instagram at actual Scott. I put them all up there as well. And sometimes video of me creating that stuff. So if you're interested in that side of my life at all, uh, I figured in light of my love of uh, love, death, and, ro and robots, I keep saying rockets, uh, that seems like maybe a good place for you to maybe want to go check out. So please do that. In the meantime, big thanks, everybody, for listening to the show. It's going to do it for us. CurrentGeek.com is our website. Find everything there that you need. Ways to contact us at all. It's going to do it for us, for me, for Tom, and for all of you. We'll see you next time. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. Hey, did you guys do... T I think they did titles today. Hold on. I just want to see. Oh, we did? I think so. Hold on. Showbot. We have titles to pick? Yeah, because they've been they've been talking about wanting to... TMS gets a billion of them in the morning, but then none of the other shows, I really don't push it because I just don't think about it. Um, dot frog pants dot com. And I um, somebody was saying last week, hey, you should do this on Current Geek. We have some good ideas in there, and then you guys just leave. Um, now I can't find it. Oh, no, Showbot. What am I thinking? Showbot.com, right? What is it? Showbot.showbot. Showbot. Showbot. Why isn't this working? Crappyolo. Well, maybe this was a dumb idea, but I was going to look and see what you guys had. I'll do it on this link. Hold on. There it is. Bring it up. Click the thing. Poke it in the deal. And that's 13. Okay. That'll work. All right. So now I'm looking at your... Oh, there it is. Frogpants.showbot.tv. Duh, Scott. Duh. It's all about URLs, man. Uh, uh, jump in the gun. We've already done it. Sliders and rings. Dangerous radish. I don't like sliders and rings. <laughs> And that ain't what it takes. I do like sliders and rings, and I also like dangerous dangerous radish. Of mice and mammoths ain't bad either. It's not bad. Dangerous radish has got to be it, though, right? Yeah, I like that one a lot, and it's currently tied for fourth. Also, I can't remember who it was now. I apologize for my bad memory, but somebody nailed it in chat with Black Eyed. Uh, dangerous Radish is my Black Eyed Peas cover band. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well done. We like to give you credit for those things, but... yeah. I'm scrolling back to see if I can find it. All right. Let's see if I can. Maybe too far back. Not screw this up. There it is. Dangerous radish. Dangerous radish. Dangerous radish. It's hard to say fast. Dangerous radish. Dangerous radish. Maybe it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's okay. All right. Well, we've done it, Tom. We've, Finally. Uh, we've done what we came here to do, and I feel pretty good about it. And I will talk I to great. you so soon. It'll make our heads spin. Bye. All right. There goes Tom. And uh, that's it. Thank you. For